again, thank you for coming. I know it's a festive holiday lights in the back, so that's great that you're here instead of already on holiday. Uh, our speakers today are Juliet Kayem and Peter Neffinger. Uh, Juliet was, until very recently, the Assistant Secretary for Intergovernmental Affairs in the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, before that, she worked uh, in Governor Patrick's administration as the Homeland Security Advisor. Uh, and at the Department of Homeland Security in D.C., she was uh, tasked with overseeing um, responses to events like the Haiti earthquake and the H1N1 outbreak, and then most recently uh, was tasked to direct uh, an interagency and intergovernmental response uh, to oversee the response to the Gulf, uh, to the BP oil spill. And in doing that, she worked very closely with her colleague, who we're also delighted to welcome here. Uh, Rear Admiral Peter Neffinger is the Director of Strategic Management and Doctrine for the United States Coast Guard. I got all of that, out, right? <laughs> uh, and in that capacity, he served as uh, the deputy uh, for the National Incident Commander for the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And this is where they worked closely together, and they are here today to share their experiences and knowledge. So please join me in welcoming them. Okay. First, I think. Well, good afternoon, and. Um, I'm wearing a short sleeve shirt out of a desire that it warms up to what it was yesterday when I flew up here. Uh, but what I'm going to do for, for you first, uh, Juliet's actually going to talk to you in just a moment, but I wanted to, to just frame the scope and complexity so that we all have a frame of reference from, from which to, to talk about this. Uh, there was a handout as you came in. If you didn't get a chance to pick it up, uh, you can pick it up on the way out. But it, it just lists the salient facts uh, of the response at its, at its peak. So, and I'm going to talk to you about the, the peak of the response in terms of its uh, size and complexity. So, so what I have up here is uh, a graphic which illustrates uh, the, the, the red dot is, of course, the location of the uh, actual site. And for those of you who can't see that, it is right there. That is, that's about 45 miles uh, southeast at the mouth, mouth of the Mississippi River. That's where the Deepwater Horizon drill rig was, was drilling in 5,000 feet of water. And it was coming to the end of a production of a drill, uh, going to, moving to production. And I think many of you may know the story, but uh, we're happy to take some questions afterwards about the specifics of that. The green represents the, the total extent of observed oil during the, during the course of the spill. That's a cumulative um, uh, graphic. It is not the size of the spill at any given moment. It is simply the cumulative uh, total observed location. So that's, that really just shows you the extent of oil impact uh, in the Gulf itself. The blue indicates the cumulative effect over the course of the spill of all of the shoreline impact. Not continuous, not necessarily contiguous, and, um, and, and certainly not all at one time. But again, that's the extent. So it affected directly three Gulf states. Um, indirectly, it affected um, uh, five total Gulf states. Uh, and, and then down in the lower left corner is, is what was called the oil budget, uh, simply a, an attempt to do an accounting of the oil. Uh, there's, as you know, there's been some controversy about that budget, uh, and, and happy to talk about that later. Uh, I'll postpone that until I get into uh, more talks. But it'll give you an example. As, this was as of uh, the 15th of August, the oil budget. And this was a, um, uh, a pie chart that was uh, agreed upon by a scientific team led by Dr. Marsha McNutt of the U.S. Geological Survey. And she was the head of what was called the Flow Rate Technical Group. And that group actually worked um, under uh, Juliet Kayam's direction as well. And then uh, I've got another slide, which is to, and so that illustrates, as I said, the scope. Uh, and then the complexity, th these graphics are simply meant to illustrate uh, uh, an example of the complexity. So you had an oil spill which had much of the traditional kinds of oil spill response going on, uh, skimming, um, uh, burning, some dispersant uh, use. And I, again, I know that there are some controversies around each of these, but we'll, uh, we'll simply state them for the time being. Uh, booming operations. But you also had this huge subsea um, industrial operation going on. So that lower left graphic is to illustrate some of that industrial operation. And you can see here you have got the, the well itself, which was, which was the, the leaking. This shows it as of uh, July 15th when this, what was called the capping stack was put on and actually sealed the well in. It shows the, the relief wells that were being drilled uh, coming down from each side. And then all of this subsea operation, these, these little guys with headlights are, are remotely operated vehicles. 
Uh, at one point, as many as 32 were operating at one time. And so you had this huge operation. And, and all of this was occurring in a space of about 4,000 um, uh, yards, uh, nautical yard diameter. So you had some 65 vessels operating in a very, very tight, about a two nautical mile radi uh, diameter. And, and that alone was an operation. And then you had this very interesting uh, operation going on that was trying to kill the well itself. And, and, and that was being handled and managed out of, out of Houston uh, by a group of uh, BP scientists. Actually, BP and some of the other majors were involved, uh, ConocoPhillips, Texaco, uh, and, um, and Shell, and the BP engineers, as well as a, a science team led by uh, Dr. Stephen Chu of the Department of Energy. And, uh, and some scientists from our national laboratories. And, and that was actually a, a very interesting operation, but again, very different from what was going on. And then we had, this just sort of illustrates some of the, um, the, the complexity of dealing with um, an event that hits so many different states and so many different people. And that was these vessels of opportunity are, are an example of uh, the impact that this spill had on the local population, the local population's livelihood, and so these were all vessels that were, that were primarily fishing boats, commercial fishermen, that, that said, look, we, we, we got to put us back to work. And one of the ways we put them back to work was through hiring them to do things like stream boom, uh, serve as sentinel vessels for oil observation, as well as, as drag sentinel booms to see if they were coming up with any subsurface oil. Uh, but again, that was an interesting operation because you had, uh, at its peak, somewhere around 3,000 of them up working. Uh, under, under contract to uh, BP primarily, uh, but being directed by uh, government uh, response uh, organizations. And uh, during the course of that, you, you can think about how challenging it might be if you think about people who typically don't work together, typically don't want to work together because they, 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 they're in competition. They really don't want people to know what they know about uh, finding fish. And so teaching them how to work radios in a way that makes them understandable with one another, teaching them what command and control means, what, what direction means, how to work in task forces and the like, was a big challenge. And there was a lot of, there was a lot of challenge associated with that over the first half of the spill. Uh, the spill itself, uh, or the, 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 the well itself, was releasing for 87 consecutive days uh, from the 20th of April until the 15th of July, at which time that capping stack was put on. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the spill, it's, and, and the response to it now is, on, is still ongoing. We still have some, I think the last count was around seven or 8,000 people still in, in active response down in the Gulf. They're still doing a lot of uh, cleanup of tar balls, uh, finding uh, some subsurface oil recently that, uh, based upon some sampling that's been done, a lot of seafood testing still going on and the like. So overall, uh, I guess the general comment would be uh, as, as a way of leading this into uh, what Juliet will talk about, and, uh, and then I'll come back and talk more about the response afterwards, the actual mechanics of the response. This was not just an oil spill. That was one small little corner of what, what this was all about. It was really a hugely, it was a traumatic psychological event uh, for the people of that region. If you think about the trauma that they've suffered over the past, so it looked like another one of those to, uh, to a great number of people. It was a, it was a media event. It was a public event uh, played out in the social media and, and public media, and it, was a, um, and it was a very political event. So with that said, I think I'll take a break. I'll let Juliet talk about the, the political nature of this event and why it was much more than just an oil spill. And then I'll get back up and, and uh, talk a little bit about the response itself, and then I think we'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Meg, for having us. I assume you can hear me. Um, so uh, as, as uh, Peter said, uh, there were sort of two sides to this response, and I think for students and people who are studying energy initiatives and energy policy, um, you can't forget the other side. I think that's the lesson of the BP oil spill. Um, uh, both Peter and I uh, worked for Thad Allen, who was the National Incident Commander. Peter is the Deputy National Incident Commander. Me is running the intergov and interagency side, which was ultimately um, the political side of the response and what we had, and what we had to do. Um, in terms of the political nature of what was going on uh, with this oil spill and uh, the and the politics of energy, which for those of us who weren't necessarily in that were interesting to discover in the Gulf states. But I think first, as Peter laid out, here was the response, right? So this was complicated. There were all these different parts. Um, you probably only really knew sort of the shoreline part. That's, you know, Anderson Cooper and Billy Nungesser every night, you know, this summer. Um, yelling about how bad the response was on the shoreline. But there's a complex response. 
But all of this was actually formed by the post um, Exxon Valdez uh, law, the um, Oil Pollution Act, what we call OPA. Um, the Oil Pollution Act was a response to the Valdez spill, um, and it sort of set the structure uh, for how the Coast Guard, and for that matter, any uh, private company and any state or locality would learn to deal or would have to deal with an oil spill. And for a very long time, um, that was the accepted legal regime um, for how uh, all of us trained, thought about, uh, and ultimately responded to uh, an oil spill. Uh, the problem, of course, was that that law dealt with a uh, surface spill, um, right? It's the boat, it has a, has a the, bo the boat has a rip, uh, a known quantity, one company, uh, one state, uh, uh, an event that had a beginning, middle, and end, uh, and also was pre-Hurricane Katrina. And I think that's important, I'll get into that li a little bit, why the politics of the spill um, hit us so hard uh, 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 as a response and as DHS and as the Coast Guard. Um, and essentially, none of those qualifications of the Oil Pollution Act actually existed in the, the BP spill. And so what we had was sort of an utter political rejection across the board, uh, uh, mayors, parish presidents, governors, and as well as uh, our, our own administration, a rejection of sort of that framework in many ways because uh, it, it just could not respond to what we were facing, which was for a time being that we thought um, uh, uh, that this could go on for uh, six to nine months. I mean, at the rate that BP was going at one stage, we thought this would be a much longer event. It was, trust me, it was long enough. So um, I want to talk through how the politics play into the energy and, and energy pol uh, policy because ultimately um, uh, it will impact, I think, uh, our, our policies going forward as a government, uh, the decisions made by private companies vis-a-vis -vis energy policy and also has a tremendous impact on our operational components. In this case, it was the Coast Guard for the Department of Homeland Security. It could have been FEMA or any other operational component. Um, so let me start with the, uh, uh, the structure of how we dealt with it. Um, we had, uh, I worked for uh, uh, Secretary Napolitano, but had known Admiral Allen uh, through a series of other crises, um, and he had asked me to come over. Uh, as you see in the handout, uh, this was one happy interagency family dealing with this spill. I think there were over 30 agencies uh, that I oversaw that were running a variety of issues related to the spill. As Peter also said, we had five um, states. Uh, and it wasn't just governors, it was mayors, parish presidents, uh, uh, and all sorts of other people who had an invested interest in what in fact was going on uh, and how we were responding. And I say this just as a matter of fact and not as partisan, it is, uh, uh, there are uh, two of those governors are likely to run against this president in two years. It was just a, a fact of the dynamics of what were going on publicly that you had a lot of operational people dealing um, hand in hand uh, between the localities, the state, and the feds, uh, but there was a political overlay that was uh, being animated by 2012, which was just clear. Um, uh, and if you don't know who they are, uh, they're, uh, no surprise, Bobby Jindal and possibly Haley Barber. So that was just the pol political dynamics were with us uh, from the get-go. Uh, the uh, three things related to how we responded and the nature of the response just ought to be considered, I think, from the White House and the administration's perspective, and they're related to the Oil Pollution Act. Um, the Oil Pollution Act set up this concept of the responsible party. Remember that term? Uh, it was uh, the act said when a company spills, the polluter pays. That's the basic construct of how we deal with oil spills, and that seems right, especially when you think you have a limited quantity. Uh, but that notion of the responsible party was very difficult to accept uh, when we saw the images of that oil spilling out because that got into the leadership questions that were being posed to uh, the president about uh, who in fact was in charge and were we just completely dependent on BP. The truth is we were dependent on BP because BP, as Peter will explain, owned the well kill operation. So it was probably the only entity that could actually deal with uh, figuring out how to close that well. Uh, but as a 
political matter and as a uh, and as certainly as a communications matter that notion of the responsible party was very difficult to hold on through the co course of the of the summer because uh, you were just completely dependent on a company that was being vilified at the same time where those of us who had to be Peter mostly in Houston me out in out in the Gulf and vice versa you had to essentially uh, uh, not had to, essentially they were your partners. That's the notion of a unified area command. Um, the second issue that I think played out in the dynamics of uh, the spill response was uh, something that happened early on, which was the moratorium. Uh, for those of you who don't, uh, who, who study energy policy, uh, the moratorium issued six days, or a moratorium on deep water um, oil uh, uh, rigs, uh, was issued six days after uh, we discovered that oil was spilling from uh, from uh, uh, the the rig, um, and uh, that moratorium uh, uh, to assess the security standards of the other offshore oil rigs uh, is something that uh, sort of sort of walks smack into the face of a lot of different interests by the Gulf states. And this is also nonpartisan, Democrats and Republicans alike, as those of you who follow Senator Landrieu and others, and Mayor Landrieu, uh, a Democratic family in, uh, in Louisiana, know that closing off deep water um, oil employment, uh, which arguably had almost no impact, a long-term impact, uh, 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 still was of concern to enough of the political apparatus in the Gulf that it became this struggle between the White House wanting the moratorium for security reasons and Gulf uh, people, people from the Gulf uh, the, and the political elite there saying, uh, uh, not only can we not fish, right, because you've closed off all the fisheries, which we did for uh, security and safety reasons and health reasons, uh, but now we can't drill anymore. And so that moratorium, and to the extent that that policy decision, I think, really had an impact on how we were treated and some of the atmospherics of the, of the spill response um, is often not spoken about, but I think really did, was sort of underneath the surface of a lot of the issues. Finally, just back to Katrina, and then I'm going to just talk a, lot about, a little bit about the interagency and intergovernmental. The expect so I described what OPA was, right? Responsible party cleans up the spill. Um, I don't. It doesn't deal with mental health issues, and it doesn't deal with the economic diversification of the Gulf, and it doesn't deal with, uh, 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 you know, how, claims. Uh, well, it deals a little bit. It deals actually with claims, but it doesn't deal with a lot of the interagency issues, uh, OSHA issues related to the labor workforce, all sorts of issues that were hitting us. Um, as an administration uh, that don't fall neatly into a normal response. OPA is a clean up regime um, dealing with oil in the water that you clean up and then the responsible party pays. And so what we tried to do and by that list that I've shown you is sort of just absorb everyone into the National Incident Command even though the law didn't cover them because expectation on government uh, to not only um, make something clean, but to make it better, and to think about all the other issues that are impacting our, com our communities was just simply something that had to be done from, I think, uh, uh, any uh, White House perspective. Uh, and so early on, uh, we absorbed, or within the National Incident Command, uh, we dealt with health issues, uh, we were dealing with commercial diversification issues, uh, we were dealing with uh, uh, economic issues um, uh, and a number of others that are listed th uh, listed there to just ensure that that um, we could address the needs of the victims of the Gulf spill, um, even if the even if the legal regime was quite limited in terms of what the Coast Guard was expected to do. So that's sort of what why this thing got so big. I mean, it got so big because of the first map too. This was just unprecedented in its size and scope. We. We spent the summer, you know, eating, uh, drinking, and 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 dreaming about the spill. I mean, it was um, so big. Uh, there was a false alarm in Texas, and I think that was when all of us were about to pack up and walk away. There was no oil in Texas, fortunately. But um, so let me talk a little bit of uh, about the intergovernmental because uh, there is a uh, as you think about and, and study energy policy, especially domestic energy policy, and I know uh, having worked for the governor here dealing with LNG and some of the energy alternatives here, 
um, you are going to be dealing with political apparatus and political leadership that has almost as much right uh, to have an opinion as uh, as uh, as a White House, for example, um, and because they're living, breathing, and dealing with it. Uh, our and so how do we deal with it? Okay, so we have five Republican governors that we're initially dealing with and, a, and, and the moratorium. So we're walking into something that was not easy uh, from the perspective of, of uh, us trying to deal with the response and work with them. Uh, we started a daily phone call every morning uh, that was started uh, uh, and hosted by Valerie Jarrett, the president's uh, senior advisor, which Peter and I and the interagency were on every morning for 96 mornings, 107, 107 days straight. Uh, and it was a way to actually give them a place to express concerns, vent, uh, uh, troubleshoot um, and talk about all the issues that they were concerned about that were outside of maybe even the response. Trust us, they complain a lot about the response on those phone calls in particular, where was the boom, why weren't things getting cleaned up fast enough, but it was actually a way in which we could sort of um, uh, own them, embrace them, however difficult it was, um, every morning for over a hundred days straight. And that became sort of the, you know, they tell us uh, we try to fix over the course of the day and then fix it. There were issues we couldn't fix, like the moratorium. I will tell you that animated the five governors um, every morning. But um, it was a way to think for, uh, you know, as these things unfold, to think about how we were actually going to deal with uh, states and localities um, uh, over the course of time. The second issue is obviously the local issue, which uh, those of you who study Boston and know what's going on in Boston with energy policy know that uh, all oil spills, all energy policy is local. Um, uh, the Oil Pollution Act, the one I described, is very state-centric. It deals with governors, and it deals with uh, the, the governors are the, the, much like most of the Department of Homeland Security, uh, it's, it's uh, governors who signed what's called the Area Contingency Plan. That's actually the plan that got uh, signed by them is at some stage in which they agreed upon uh, uh, how we would deal to an oil response. Um, it is the uh, it is governors that tend to get the money. Uh, BP issued checks to four or five of the governors early on for advertising um, to get them to be able to advertise that the fish was safe, that the beaches were open, or wherever it was that they wanted to advertise. But it's a very very governor state centric. Uh, law, our own orientation as a department um, is very state-centric, and it's, it's, it's safe to say, uh, and we will all admit it, we were probably a little bit slow on, on dealing with the localities. Um, and so it sort of hit us, which were in, in Louisiana, it's these people known as the parish presidents um, that were on TV a lot over the course of the summer in Alabama, Mississippi, mayors, and in Florida county, uh, county heads. Um, and so you just had this uh, local, uh, uh, these local leaders who had their own agendas, maybe right, maybe wrong, but had their own agendas vis-a-vis -vis the spill that as a response agency and as, a, as, a, as, as uh, representing the administration, we were just a little bit slow on knowing what those concerns were and dealing with them. And over the course of the, of the time, and I think, you know, the truth is, I think BP would also say, you know, we, we sort of all learned retail over the course of the summer, um, uh, just how localized this event was given how big it was. And I think uh, we did a number of things to fix that over the course of the summer, uh, uh, putting uh, sort of senior liaisons with each, with each of the parish presidents, um, trying to come up with solutions. But ultimately, it's safe to say that each of the parish presidents, in particular Louisiana, which got hit the worst, Mississippi, uh, barely so, just the currents, we were pretty lucky. Um, that the parish presidents ended up having their own plans, that uh, working with the Coast Guard to deal with their own planning, even though we had always traditionally worked with the state. And so um, all energy policy and all energy initiatives are local. Um, the final thing I just want to end with is uh, sort of the future of, uh, uh, I think, uh, where we go from here. And this is where I think Peter is going to get into the wealth operation. There are the, the, this was not, as Peter said, an oil spill. This was uh, a, a political dynamic by, you know, one week into the spill, the pre you know, people are wondering, is this, you know, President Obama's Hurricane Katrina? That, is, that has an impact on the way people react to things uh, over time. Uh, I think in the future, uh, the lessons learned for us as a response component, as the Department of Homeland Security, that, you know, it's not only that we have 
the Coast Guard, we also have FEMA, uh, which had its own problems with Hurricane Katrina. In fact, one of the ironies of the spill was uh, when the Coast Guard was being accused of being too slow on the on the pickup, you know, you had all these Gulf governors telling us, where's FEMA, where's FEMA? And we thought, okay, this is, you know, this is a uh, interesting request given uh, what had happened in Hurricane Katrina. The truth is they, the governor sort of understood FEMA, their, their relationship with the Coast Guard, uh, they didn't quite know as well. The reason why the Coast Guard was the lead agency was because under the Oil Pollution Act, um, that <coughs> Uh, it was actually the responsible party that had to pay all the bills. If you had put it under a FEMA regime in which, you know, like it was like a hurricane pickup, it's actually the taxpayers who have to pay. So we had an incentive uh, for a lot of reasons uh, that the Oil Pollution Act and that legal regime uh, remained uh, the sort of focal point uh, uh, for how we were going to deal with it, no matter how stretched it got over time and no matter how much everyone sort of complained about it. I think ultimately the Oil Pollution Act, with some of the fixes that I talked about, being less state-centric, um, uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, having to deal with a long-term spill and one in which the quantity is unknown, um, the Oil Pollution Act probably worked for us over time, no matter how much it got criticized. Uh, by the uh, uh, by, the politicians across the board. So I'm just going to end with where I think that this is going before we turn to. So I think some of the science of the well kill, kill operations, which I think is probably one of the other um, huge legacies of this spill, what was happening underneath um, the surface. Uh, what I think shocked us from the response uh, thing was both from the governors and the mayors and the parish presidents and the White House is in any event uh, related to something that people don't know a lot about, in this case oil, but you could imagine LNG or, or nuclear and, um, or any other um, uh, substance. There is an insatiable appetite for information. And I think we spent probably the first three or four weeks um, trying to uh, uh, deal with uh, this desire to know what was going on, uh, how much was coming out, how much we were picking up, whether we were being successful, how many tar balls were in Texas versus Mississippi or wherever else. Um, and it's that information that ultimately, and that sort of quest for information from a political apparatus uh, across the board that uh, uh, that was not only exhausting, but I think also uh, drove some of the decisions that were made over time um, in terms of what was going on in our in our response and operations. And I think that now leads back to Peter, who's going to talk a little bit about some of those, some of the, or I think the controversies related to some of our decisions um, uh, on the on the response side. Now that we get through the politics, thank you. So by way of background, uh, I've, I've been in the Coast Guard for 29 years, and most of that 29 years has been spent doing emergency response, whether it's search and rescue or maritime casualties, oil spills. I have a lot of background in oil spills, maybe uh, about 150 or so over the over 29 years that I've responded. Nothing like this, but but some some pretty good ones, including the Exxon spill um, in 1989, and. Uh, and, and there's, a, there's a way in which you respond and you become used to it uh, over time. And there's something that, that, um, that, that uh, a set of expectations, I think, for how we operate. We also spend a lot of time exercising to, pre to prepare for oil spills. And we exercise with the very people that we think might spill oil. So in this case, um, uh, BP is, a, is, a, is, a, is an exercise partner over the years. The Oil Pollution Act of 1990 that Juliet mentioned uh, uh, requires a certain amount of exercising with the people who could potentially be responsible for spilling. And ultimately, the, the, the reason the Coast Guard is out there is because we're charged under the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, actually previously under the Tanker Safety Act of the late 70s, with responding to, with preventing, if possible, that's the best thing to do, uh, responding to, if necessary, oil spills in, in the water. Uh, and we have, a, we have a joint agreement with EPA. EPA is the other side. So that's, we're called the Federal On-Scene Coordinator, and you may have heard that term, but that's just a term out of law. EPA holds it on land and we hold it on water and then we jointly agree upon where the demarcation line is um, uh, in the coastal zone. And typically it goes somewhat inland. And then we work actually pretty closely with EPA. So that's re the reason the Coast Guard is doing that. I will tell you, however, though, when you have that, that there's no way that that is good. And there's no way that, there's, that, there's, that, that, that anything but a whole lot of uh, upset and, and concerned people are going to come as, as a result of that. And, and as I said, that wasn't, it's not like a single monolithic spill, but over the course of the summer, that's all the places oil touched. So, so clearly preventing it is the best way to go. But once it happens, 
there is not going to be a good story. You're going to have shoreline impact uh, no matter what you do uh, because there's just too much out there when you have, when you have a, a quarter billion barrels of oil. Was it, no, five billion barrels of oil at the, at the end of the day is what the, uh, is what the um, uh, estimate was. And, uh, and then when you have all of these different components of it, then you're going to have some problems as well because everyone is really concerned about this piece and this piece, the boom here. But this was really the challenge. Uh, the, once oil hits the water, there's only, there's only so many things you can do. Uh, the, the unfortunate thing is over the last 20 years, there hasn't been a lot of research and development that goes into doing something other than skimming, burning, and dispersing oil. And, and there's, there's reasons for that. Um, I think that with the, one of the great success stories of the Oil Pollution Act of 1990 is it dramatically reduced the number of oil spills from ships. And that's what it was a tanker-centric act. It was a ship-centric act. It was designed to deal with prevention um, on ship, you know, prevention of oil spills from ships, and then response to oil spills from ships if they happen. So it set up an entire regime for how that works. And this responsible party idea says that, look, whoever spills that stuff is going to be responsible for cleaning it up, including having the right equipment and the contracts in place with cleanup uh, companies to do that. But it, as Juliet said, it envisioned a finite spill, one that had a beginning, middle, and end, and was defined by the quantity of oil that would most likely be spilled if a ship were to have a collision. It, it did not envision and did not address at all subsurface oil drilling uh, into a reservoir that might you know, run for a number of years before it, ever, before it ever finishes up. Now, the other thing I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about the, the mechanics of this particular spill. I, is anybody here familiar with subsea uh, drilling with what blowout preventers are and that sort of thing. So some of you are. If 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 those of you who might be experts in that, uh, I I will not. I'm I, I'm not an expert. I will tell you this. I'm not a subsurface engineer. I did spend four months uh, going to um, um, drilling school uh, as a uh, as part of my training in the Coast Guard and and I, and I and I spent some time with Cameron Corporation where they build blowout preventers and some time offshore. But I, that's as close as I come to being an expert. So if, you, if I say something, please correct me if I, if I say something that, that's, that's mistaken. But what I want to talk about is, is sort of how, what, what happened, first of all. So you had, this, you had this, this well being drilled into a reservoir somewhere down here, because it was, it was pretty deep, about, about 18,000 feet below the surface of the water, ultimately. And, and it was, uh, as I said, they were, they were finishing up the, the drilling of the well, moving to production. And, it was, and, it's, and that's a, a, a pretty risky time when you're, when you're moving from active drilling to producing a well because they have to do a lot of things to change it out. These things called blowout preventers are designed to, to stop hydrocarbons and or gas from escaping the well in an uncontrolled manner. And they do so, it's hard to see on this drawing, but, but there's a series of valves uh, actually rams that, that close, and they do, they, they close uh, for different reasons. Some shear off the drill string, some close around the drill string to keep it intact. Some of them are designed to, to close in various ways. But overall, the idea is that you can, you can in some manner, you close off the well from the surface or from, from, from exiting. And, and it was considered, I mean, you heard people talk all early in the summer about the fail-safe system that, that, that failed. Uh, the important thing to remember is that these are not fail-safe systems. They don't, they don't fail to safe. They fail to whatever they were at the time they failed. And so, so one of the problems associated with this is that they don't, they don't necessarily fail to a closed position. They, they simply just don't work. And there's lots of reasons why, why this failed, and, and there's, a, there's a very good uh, initial summary investigation that was actually done by BP themselves that gives some, some, a pretty good timeline of events and, and critical, critical events that happened that led to the explosion. Uh, these other two blow-up preventers, same thing, they, they were used for the relief well. But what happened is, as best as can be determined, is somehow the signal, there, there, there's, a, there's a cable that runs up. You don't see the drill rig here, but if we use this one, this is, a, this is what they call a riser pipe. There's a cable that runs up alongside of it that runs to control pods, uh, redundant control pods on either side of the BOP. And in that control pod, are all of the, um, the signals that are sent to the various valves that have to operate the hydraulic system. There's a, there's a bunch of hydraulic bottles on the, on the, on the blowout preventer itself that activate the valves. Well, for whatever reason, that failed to operate. It might be that the control pods themselves were damaged, where the, the batteries didn't work, uh, or they lost the signal. And, and again, we won't really know uh, until they, they do some more forensics. But the, the signal was lost. And normally what would happen in the event when they start seeing 
oil come out through the, through the top of the, the, the derrick, which is what they saw. Uh, they, hit the, they hit a button up here, a series of buttons, close, I'm making this very simple, it closes off the valves and stops the flow of oil. That didn't happen. The other thing that's supposed to happen is this is actually a, a, two components here. There's, there's the blowout preventer, which is the valves, and there's this thing that's called the lower marine riser package. It's actually, uh, it's got a couple of valves or, or rams on it as well. But, uh, but it holds the control systems. It should break away if uh, all goes well. They can do an emergency breakaway and then, and then pull that off. This closes and everything's fine. And that's typically how it's supposed to work. Well, all that, obviously that didn't work and, and you had an escape of, of oil. The, um, the other problem is when that happened, there was a lot of, a lot of concern over, well, well, what went wrong? Why didn't that work? And, and the very first part of the, the response was trying to figure out, well, what, what happened? What happened in this, in this blowout preventer uh, they kept it from closing, and what's the condition of the wellbore itself? A lot of, you, you may have what, heard on the news, a lot of concerns about, you know, the integrity of the wellbore. And again, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, if you think of the wellbore, you, you drill the well first, and as they're drilling the well, they line the well with casing, and ultimately that casing looks like a, like a tripod leg as it gets down to the bottom. It, it's successively smaller size, so it looks as though you could just collapse the whole thing together. But they're in 30-foot sections or so, and every 30 feet, they're cemented to one another. Hangers hold them on, and they cement around it, and it goes down another 30 feet or so. There's a series of cement plugs in the annular space around that prevents oil from coming up the outside, or hydrocarbons from coming up the outside. And then, and then inside the cement casing is where the drill pipe goes down, and the drill string is hollow. They pump mud down through the drill string. It's what lubricates the, the drill bit, it takes the cuttings. The cuttings come up around the outside of the drill string through the casing and they're examined at the surface. And so it looks like what happened is obviously you had a release of oil up through there. Well, the concern was that, that the cement job wasn't as, as adequate or as substantial or as, as, um, as robust as it should have been in various locations, a couple of key locations. And there was a real question as to as the integrity of the, of the casing string itself. And what I, mean, what I mean by that is there was some, some concern that maybe you had hydrocarbons leaking out into the formation. So there's a great deal of time spent this summer trying to determine what kind of condition that wellbore was in. It was 15,000 PSI at the reservoir. Uh, that's, that's very high pressure. Uh, about 8,000 PSI here, and ultimately about uh, four or 5,000 PSI at the top of the of the of the BOP, so there were some obviously some restrictions in here that were that were keeping the pressure up, but at at at, a, at somewhere between eight and fifteen thousand psi, that's a lot of pressure. And the real concern was if they just capped the well, without understanding the the condition of the well bore, you could ex you could blow out the, the sides of the casing, have a release into the formation, and ultimately an uncontrolled release up through the fracturing that would occur. So the real reason it took so long to actually put the cap on the top of the well. Once, once they figured out how to do it with this capping stack, is that there was a real concern about the condition of it. And that's what the science team was working on and, and, and trying to understand. Uh, and, and, and at the end, it was just kind of a close, you know, cross your fingers and close the valve and see what happens uh, kind of event it, and, and hope that you didn't have to uh, reopen it again. Uh, fortunately, it held, and it turns out that the, that the, the well bore was generally intact. Uh, but, but Typically, the way you, you do one of these operations, as, as Juliet was mentioned, is you stand up a, a, a response uh, command of some sort. And it's, uh, in our case, it was, a, it was a command that consisted of people from the state level, uh, from the federal government level, and the, uh, the local level. And again, when you have something that's, that, that's this size, there's really no way to have local control and have a unified approach to how you do this. So again, the Oil Pollution Act of 1990 envisions a federal government controlled response. I know there was, a lot, there was a lot of talk early on in the news about why the federal government wasn't in charge. Uh, the federal government was actually always in charge, but it's in charge under, under this unified command concept. And that's not a concept that most people understand that, that sounds right. I mean, they want to see that one person standing up there uh, making the decisions, and, and when you have something that's as complex as this, it, it's very difficult to, say, to see how one person could do it. You had so many different events going on. Uh, ultimately, Thad Allen became the individual who was, who was responsible for coordinating all of those entities and ultimately became the, the voice of the response itself. But I think that at this point, you know, rather than uh, simply going on, it would be much more interesting to find out what kind of questions you might have and Juliet and I are happy to, to answer that. That was, that was just to, to try to frame it for you uh, and then to see if there's things that, you've, that you were concerned about, that you had objections to, or more importantly, that you just have questions about. Uh, happy, to, happy to answer those.
Yes, sir. Well, the first question is, is uh, I think the most obvious first question is about the very beginning of this. Mm -hmm. When I remember when the, when, when the first reports were coming out and the Coast Guard the lead Coast Guard officer, a woman whose name I don't remember. Mary Landry. Is Mary Landry, yeah. Came out with an estimate of the, the spill, the level of the, the spill or the intensity of the spill, That's which right. turned out to be way, way off. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? And how was that, how was that dealt with in the beginning? Because part of the reason, obviously, for asking about this isn't only that the flow rate and all that has a lot to do with how much BP mm -hmm. ends up being liable for and, uh, and other things like that. But the argument was that this had an impact on the sense of urgency of, about the initial response. And that there was, that the people were kind of l maybe a little bit lulled to s sleep in the beginning by this really um, you know, seriously erroneous estimate. You're right. There was a very low estimate. And, and at the risk of sounding self-serving, I, I will tell you, I don't think that it responded, it, it affected the sense of urgency. Because even at 5,000 barrels a day, that's a lot of oil. And, uh, and, and, and you're going to, and if it's coming out continuously, you're going to need a lot of stuff to respond to it, even 5,000 barrels a day. That's a lot, like I said, times 42. Um, here's the problem, and I think that it's that, First of all, I don't think that as an, as an entity, we who are responding in total, and, and let me explain my role. I was at the deputy at the National Incident Command, which meant I wasn't, I wasn't a responder at, operationally. My job was policy and interaction with the federal government, uh, uh, senior federal officials at the top level. Uh, so, but I can tell you that, that again, going back to my, my background in emergency response, we were throwing everything we had at it that was available. Uh, we can talk about some of the structural reasons why there wasn't enough available. And, and, and that has to do with who oversees stuff on the bottom of the ocean. It's not the Coast Guard. It's, it was MMS at the time, now B-O-E-M-R-E. But, but we said, look, we'll figure out the amount later. That's, that's really, it's, it, ultimately, the amount that's coming out is, is a liability and legal and, and claims issue downstream. We'll throw everything we have at it and, and worry about the amount later. Uh, that's, that's a way a responder might think, uh, but it's not the way a politician thinks, it's not the way the public thinks, and it's not the way the public wants to hear the federal government respond. I think what it became, and, and, and you, you've hinted at it and implied it, that it became an indication of, of, of lack of understanding of the complexity and the size of the spill. Uh, I think that, um, unfortunately, that number, we, we just became fixated on, on that number as the answer and moved on to other things. And ultimately, I think it was Thad Allen who said, look, we got to get somebody on this thing to figure out what the actual amount is. And this flow rate team, this flow rate technical group was the official name uh, under Dr. Marsha McNutt, began to do some very real challenging calculations. Now, the other piece was it, it's challenging to figure out what's coming out on the bottom of the ocean. The other problem is, is that these, these blowout preventers are, are, are relatively dumb. I mean, there's no sensing equipment of any kind on. They didn't have flow sense flow meters, they don't have pressure gauges, they don't have lots of things that you would like to have. In fact, one of the things some of the scientists said was, how come you don't have that stuff on there? And, and, and I think it goes back to that, that belief that you have a fail-safe system, so why should we worry about that? So it was really challenging to get that. And I, I think you watched some of that play out in the media. You had, you had people from other um, uh, academic communities saying, well, I think it's 100,000 barrels, and I've done it by, by analyzing the rate at which the gas bubbles are expanding and the volume or the speed at which the, 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 the oil is flowing out. Uh, I will tell you that there's still not consensus on the actual flow rate. It's still a range that's been given, somewhere between 30,000 and 60,000 barrels a day. Uh, and because we never capped it and collected fully, you may never have an actual answer. They're still working those calculations. That, and, and, and I think they're trying to narrow that range down somewhat. They have to. For, uh, for liability purposes, uh, the, you know, how the ultimate amount that was spilled, it really does affect the amount of potential uh, criminal and civil penalties that, that BP may be liable for, BP and the other responsible parties. Can but I, I think that, uh, you know, and I'll turn to you, yeah. I, I, I would say that, that you're right, that we should have paid more attention to it early on. I don't think it affected the amount of stuff that was thrown at it, because I was in those discussions when we were literally grabbing everything we could from everywhere and putting it on scene, every skimmer that was available, all the boom. 
uh, uh, you know, boom, there's only 4,000 feet a week being manufactured at the beginning of the spill. It, it was about a quarter million feet a week. Uh, that was, this is hard boom that was being manufactured by the middle of the spill. Uh, there's a, there, there, it's difficult to pull equipment from other places of the country because the law requires a certain amount to be available. So the challenge was not, was not you know, did we get the flow rate right? It was, do we have, even have enough equipment for what we think is the flow rate? Uh, I, I think the jury's still out as to whether or not um, that lulled people. I, I, didn't, I didn't see that in, in the senior people. But less clear to, to really get at is the suspicion that some, some people might have that if you have a low, if you, if you err on the side of a low estimate, mm -hmm. the public relations mm -hmm. damage for BP <laughs> is a lot less because it's always the first impression that's the most right. important impression that's in right. people's minds. So if the first impression is, well, it's, it's only that thousand. Bad, mm -hmm. then let me let me just people, end here because this is that's more, and that's right. a more complicated. So yeah. I, I think BP would tell you that no number got them good good PR. So um, uh, only killing the well did. So I don't. I think that I. Look, I'm going to agree with you on this, and this is where Peter and I are in different worlds, and rightfully so, mm -hmm. because I, I think you're right. I think we never. I, the, 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 the committing to the 1000, which was the number we had at the time uh, that Mary Landry began yeah, with, and, and, then, and then it went to five, and then it went to 20, and then we got, and then we got people working on it. Um, I would agree with you that as we look through the lessons learned on the sort of the, not just the communication side, but I think also people sense that we had grip, that, that we knew what we were doing uh, it was very difficult uh, having uh, to, uh, until we could sort of say we have our own number and are the best scientists and, mm -hmm. and peer reviewed by outside scientists are agreeing with that number, including scientists here. Um, and that just took a while. Part of it is what Peter said was um, at some stage, it was just a lot of oil. And I know that sounds really weird, but like, you know, you're, you're, you're I mean, look at this, you're, you're burning it. You're killing, you know. You're dispersing it in subsea. You're you're doing all this stuff, and some of it's coming ashore, and some of it's not. So you're just. But I I would agree with you that uh, for the different worlds we lived in, that this well, was I mean, hard. Well, I, I I fully agree. You, yeah. you need to nail that down first. And yeah. I mean, I think that would one of be our lesson learned. Yeah. As, as a lesson that comes out of all of the investigations, is you got to nail Flow that agree. down. Yeah. Because it because it 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 affects your ability to operate. It, it affects public confidence. It affects political confidence, and it affects your ability Grit. to just. Yeah. Let's do another question. Let's take another That's what I mean. From yeah. Victor, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I, perhaps the control cable did fail, but the fact of the matter is they subsequently sent submersibles down there if you're supposed to be able to activate the thing manually, and it didn't work. Yeah. That's uh, right. Is it known at least whether that was due to damage done by the blowout when it happened, or was that part of the original failure as well? Well, it could be. I, you know, they're doing the forensics on that blowout preventer right now. It, it's, it's up on land. It's in, um, um, uh, at the NASA Mishu uh, facility down in New Orleans. And they're, they, meaning the federal government, is overseeing a disassembly of that uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a defined manner. As, and they're trying to figure out, you know, what, what happened to it. Um, there was a lot of intervention done to try to make that work. It, it looks as though they actually were able to get some of those rams to operate, but when the, when the explosion happened, I mean, one of the things they found when they, when they pulled the blowout preventer up was they found two drill strings side by side jammed down into the blowout preventer. It's unclear exactly how that happened. There's some two drill strings, meaning that the drill string itself somehow snapped and, 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 and a portion of it jammed down in with the other one. So, so it's, it's jammed down through it, and it's unclear exactly how that happened. There's some theories that as the, as the drill rig sank, it, it sort of stretched the drill string like a rubber band, snapped it, and maybe a piece shot back down in. That's one theory. There's some other theories that said, no, something else happened, and it fell in after it, after it broke. So it's, it's unclear when that occurred. Did that occur at? That's right. Plus 5,000 psi of pressure. Well, exactly. So, <laughs> so I, I, I honestly can't answer your question, I, and, I, but I, and I think that, that your question is one of the questions that, that's being asked, is what happened? Why, didn't, why weren't they able to get this thing to work? We have a policy question. Yeah. Uh, clearly, BP is going to end up shelling out like $20 billion somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, 
Uh, and, but my understanding is there's a, a limit on liability of $75 million from this act. So the question is going forward, mm -hmm. what's going to happen to people who want to drill in the Gulf of Mexico? Are they going to need to escrow $20 billion? Do they have to have a $20 billion? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. I think, well, uh, how, how do you let make me, sure that whoever does the so drilling? So to pay? explain this to everyone, the $20 billion that BP agreed to was outside of any legal obligations, but mm -hmm. was an agreement for a variety of reasons that you can imagine were animating them at the time. Um, to have an escrow uh, for a number of things. It wasn't just claims. It was, although that is the core of where the 20 billion will go. And there's gonna be a debate, Ken, the, all of us sort of wiped our hands of claims that's gonna be really long term and messy and, and, a, and normal claims go through the, the Coast Guard and a, and, a, and a structure within the Coast Guard. Uh, uh, you know, is the restaurant owner in North Carolina who didn't get drivers stopping on the highway, is there, uh, you know, is there going to Alabama for a beach vacation? Vacation, can they get their claims? These are the things that Ken Feinberg, the independent uh, uh, mediator, is going to have to deal with. But uh, through negotiations with the White House, that $20 billion was neither a cap, neither a floor nor a ceiling, but just a way to, I think, in, in real terms, to sort of say, for BP to say, uh, uh, this is, you know, we, we are here and we are committed uh, to at least putting $20 billion forward to pay for some of these claims. That well, is that's outside any the, legal obligation. To the $10 billion that they've right. spent on direct response costs right. uh, to date, uh, which I suspect is going to be that's going to be a lot more, more than $10 billion going, over yeah. time. If you want to drill in the deep water in the Gulf of Well, I think you're going to see the liability limits go, go up. up. I mean, Congress has already talked about doing that and, saying, and, and lifting that $75 million cap. Uh, I also think you're going to see the oil, there's, a, there's a trust fund called the Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund, which was set up after Open 90. It currently runs from anywhere from a billion to two billion. It, it has, a, has a range. And, and when it reaches a, a billion dollars, then, then a, a, a tax on the production of oil, kicks, a barrel per oil production tax kicks in. It gets it up somewhere between one and two billion, and it kicks out again. The problem with that fund is not that, and, and that what that fund is used for is to, is to defray uh, government costs uh, while we're waiting to get reimbursed from, from the responsible party. So the idea is, is, that, is that no taxpayer money, direct taxpayer money goes into paying for an oil spill cleanup. Uh, the problem with that is that it's capped at, at a maximum of $1 billion per incident, meaning that once we hit, and we're, we're at about $700 million that we've spent out of that fund so far, it's been reimbursed. But, but the cap doesn't matter whether you've been reimbursed or not. Once you hit a billion dollars, you can no longer spend out of that fund for this incident. And we, we think we're probably going to go past that. So I suspect that Congress will address some of those issues immediately. How that will affect um, drilling, I, I don't know. Um, but I think that um, that's something that the majors, I think, are looking at. Uh, is, is what does this mean <laughs> for us in terms of what kind of insurance we have right. to carry? Right. Yes, and in the back. You guys look like you really have a hard summer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and you work really hard. And I yeah. thank you for it. I mean, obviously, you know, you're, you're prime professionals and you've really devoted your lives to this. And I appreciate it. And I'm sure a lot of other people around the world do too. My remembrance of Exxon Valdez was there was 10, 15, 20 years of discussion in Congress about double hull tankers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what the law is now. Uh, all double-hauled now. All yeah, double all double-hauled. In fact, now there's, we're moving to double-hauled cargo ships. But the, all tankers now. There might be one or two uh, that are still playing out their grandfather years. But, but, but I mean, it's almost all, it's all double-haul required now. it took now. time after Exxon Valdez yeah. to get that. Yeah, absolutely. Position. It did. My understanding of the way that deep water drilling happens in the United States as to other countries Well, they're not, they're not regulated. They're not, not inspected by the federal government. Zero redundancy. Yeah. Yeah. How long do you think it's going to take us to come up to the best practices of the others around the world who are doing uh, deep water drilling? Well, you know, that's a good question. I, and, and Juliet may have a more insight. I can just tell you from the operator standpoint, I know that, I mean, I, I, I sat in front of many, many congressional hearings this summer. Uh, <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> Which, by the way, is not something you want to do on no. a regular basis. But uh, nor do you want to be talking to the nor do you want to be talking to the president every week unless he's putting a medal around your neck because it's usually not the most pleasant thing to do after a while. Um, but 
I, I, I don't know what the new Congress is going to do. Uh, I can tell you that, that, that this last session of Congress talked a lot about fixing some of those structural issues that says, look, at a minimum, there needs to be an inspection and some sort of a, some sort of a, a, a structural requirement for how these things are constructed and, and the types of redundancies you might have to have in place. Uh, I, I think it remains to be seen what happens with what MMS became, this Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Regula Regulation and Enforcement. Uh, I don't think that I don't think their transformation is done yet, and I think Congress is going to say something about right. their continued transformation. Uh, the other thing you have to do is somehow connect. Uh, if you go back to what I said before about oversight, you know the Coast Guard's response. This is a vessel. It's classified as a ship. It, it, it's self-propelled to move itself around the world. We're responsible for inspecting and certifying everything on that ship, including the plan for how you respond to an oil spill from the stuff that that ship carries. You know, the, 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 its own fuel. But we don't inspect the derrick, and we don't inspect the drill floor, and we don't inspect this, this thing that connects to the bottom. This is all, was all MMS. So, so there's a disconnect, there's a gap there, if you will, in terms of oversight. And, and I think you're going to see that gap get closed. There's been a lot of talk to the Norwegians and others who do big drilling in the North Sea to see how are they doing it around the world. I just don't know what the new Congress is going to do and whether that's still a priority. Maybe my, you have my some guess, insight okay, into so that. I, so there has been some regulatory changes, but there haven't been anything like the double hole requirements, um, partially because uh, I think there wasn't a lot of expectation that there would be an Oil Pollution Act um, 2011 or whatever year. Uh, what we're hearing, and you can actually, I think, uh, you can feel it by the lack of oversight as sort of what oil spill. Um, uh, you know, this thing, this thing killed us in the summer, but there's not a lot of uh, <coughs> things to be gained uh, for either taking on the administration for their response um, or, uh, you know, with, the with all these other issues that have brought in this new Congress. So I actually think, I mean, you know, to the extent that uh, we're not hearing a lot about a lot of oversight hearings for this spill, which we were a little bit concerned about given just the change in uh, uh, the Congress and the makeup of the Congress, and we're not hearing that we're going to get hauled in or anything. Um, I actually think that there probably will not. My guess is, and I can say this because I'm out of government now, but my guess is is that there's not a lot of strong political will. There might be regulatory changes, administrative changes, mm -hmm. but I don't think you're going to see this huge statutory regime uh, build up. I will say though that uh, that. Uh, uh, not only would, when, when Peter said you better stop it before it happens because we certainly, there's a lot going on, the uh, companies will, I think, will have their own incentive um, uh, to, to make sure um, that they are not having this happen again because uh, whatever BP, the legacy is of the spill and our response, the legacy for BP is equally uh, going to be something that they're going to be dealing with for a long time. Um, including the 20 billion, right? That is a lot of money for shareholders. So just in the real world politics of this. As someone that's worked on uh, oil spills for quite a while, what is the uh, perception of MMS for the event? What, uh, how effective they were? And well, what role they played in well, I, uh, maintaining the drilling? Well, I can tell you how we interact with them. Uh, and, and I think the, so with respect to preventing or responding to oil spills, I mentioned that there's a requirement for vessels to have plans in place to respond to the worst possible discharge they might have. And in the case of that drill rig, it was 700,000 gallons of diesel fuel on board and, and, a, and a small quantity of aviation fuel that they carry for the helicopters that, that, that transport people in and out. So there was a plan in place that said, here's how we're going to respond to that if we, lo if we lost the entire 700,000 gallons. Uh, MMS, now B-O-E-M-R-E, uh, had a requirement for plans to respond to blowouts of wells um, if they did. Their regulations allow a comprehensive plan, meaning a, a plan that speaks to, in general terms to a general area of operation uh, that, that, that would say if in this area something were to blow out, this is a, these are the resources we have available. And, they, and they, they're required to do something called a worst case discharge. The, the problem was is that the, the agency responsible for the plan was not required to review the plan. So, so in other words, if it's an oil spill in water, we have to respond to it. MMS doesn't have a response requirement. And, and I think that, that if, I, if I had to say where, where, where the real gap was, it's in, it's in not connecting those two agencies. So, so I would say it, 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 it's almost 
hard to say that MMS failed because they didn't have a, they didn't have a requ requirement to, to think about response. They just had a requirement to have a plan. And, and that may sound sort of stupid, but if you think about it, if you're not required to respond to it, then you really don't care about the plan. I think that's what happens in, in, in agencies. <laughs> you know, if you're not going to be responsible for taking care of the mess that it cleans up, then you'll just check the box for a plan. And I think you, you saw that, um, I think one of the plans talked about sharks and, do right. and, and seals that walruses. Things, walruses. and walruses, things that don't even exist down there. So um, I will tell you that gap will get closed. Yeah. Uh, if, if for no other reason than that we want to close it, because I don't, ever want to have to respond to something like that again, not knowing it's going to happen, uh, or not being aware of the potential for it to happen. Yeah, really just a comment about the, the blowups or whatever, and all the focus that has been brought on that. I mean, that's, uh, it's not quite a red herring, but you know, I would say that's just the last point of failure Absolutely. in this yeah. process. And so yeah. uh, it's been kind of uh, comical to watch you know, all the you know, uh, very careful diagnosis of what may have happened in the blowout perimeter when actually the oil industry knows that they're not very effective to that's right. speak on it. And uh, so, you know, probably there will be some regulation yeah. beyond the BOP, I guess. Well, I think you're right. And actually, I would, I would recommend that you, I think it's posted on the Deepwater Horizon response website. Uh, there, the um, I can't remember the guy's the name. Study the, the, the study that the BP that did. It was, a, it was an, it was an internal investigation of the event. And, and, and putting aside, you know, that, it, that BP was investigating itself, it's actually a pretty good read. And it, and it talks exactly to your point. And what they do is they set up, a, you've all seen the Swiss cheese diagrams, the exploded Swiss cheese diagram that shows how if you get just the right combination of events, you can draw a line right through a block of Swiss cheese because you can hit all the right holes. And, and what they do is they show for each slice of that Swiss cheese diagram, they say, here's a critical event at which you could have stopped this from happening. And it, it goes all the way back to things like the last cementing operation. So you're absolutely right. The blowout preventer was simply the last thing, thing that failed in a long string of failures that led to this explosion. We, we um, used to call the blowout preventer, I think I have to just remind uh, where we were uh, on, on the shore, which is there were these things, you know, that everyone focused on. I don't know why that is. It might have been media purposes. It's easy to conceptualize a blowout preventer. But it also was with boom. Um, remember the boom wars about who got boom and what. As a things I didn't know before that I know now, the quantity of boom and how much boom and tripling the boom and the president promised to triple boom and boom essentially though was just a small piece of what we would respond to, how we would respond. Mm -hmm. But it became this uh, 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 issue like the blowout preventer that I think that the public. Uh, could really sort of get their head around because, you know, this oil spewing from the, you know, the bottom of the ocean was just, it was very hard to conceptualize. And so part of this was just, you know, I think people focusing on the thing that they could really sort of understand in a weird way, something that they could hold. The other comment, just real quickly, was, you know, you, you sort of intimated that maybe the oil companies would be more motivated now not to have accidents. But, you know, I think that motivation is there before. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> right. Sometimes well, a significant but, emotional I, I, experience I, like this can, can, can provide no, more money. Yeah. Um, I think uh, 20 billion is a lot of money. Uh, 30, right? Well, if you add in the response, 30, but it's a lot of money. I have not a technical comment because you asked for it. <laughs> so we do that. And then I have a question on governance, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. In terms of the technical comment, the casing uh, are screwed. Oh right. Yeah. In okay. terms of the uh, in terms of the uh, government, is that you said you had responsibility of fifty eight agencies, I believe. Yeah, the, the agencies what? are sub agencies. Okay. What amount of authority uh, had you and did you uh, have uh, to exercise it? How, what amount of what? what amount of authority? So I was How on. The, did you, did you have yeah. So I I formed everyone into teams. So I oversaw sort of the heads of each of these uh, components in terms of what they were dealing with. Now remember, but that wasn't the response. They were the response. I was sort of everything else. I mean, really, you know, boom and where you put the ships and stuff like that. I was energy agency. The way it works. Uh, this was an interesting event. Normal counterterrorism, homeland security events are run out of the national security. Council at the White House. Um, and there are these meetings called the deputy meetings. This is all Washington speak, but the deputies of each agency sit at the table and uh, deal with all these issues. And there's one lead or two lead, in our case, Interior. Mm -hmm. So our deputy uh, or I 
by the end, because there were three times a week and it was crazy, would sit there and run all the interagency issues, most of them dealing with environmental issues, um, uh, the health issues, the mental health issues, all this other stuff. On the NIC structure, National Incident Command structure, I'm, I'm, I'm the other person dealing with the mm -hmm. interagency, but I'm not within the Coast Guard chain of command. I was within so the The authority DHS really came command. through Admiral Allen. Yeah who was named the National Incident Commander. It, this is in, it, actually, it's a great if question. you're a student of these sort of arcane government authorities, uh, the National Incident Command had never, had, had never been established before, ever. This was right. the first time, it, other than an exercise. Uh, there was something called a spill of national significance that, you know, that almost seemed like self-evident declaration. <laughs> but it was actually a declaration out of, out of the law. But all that declaration does is allow for the establishment of something called a National Incident Commander. And typically that person was viewed as either the the, the sitting head of the Coast Guard or the right, sitting yeah. head of EPA, the two people who hold that authority as federal unseen coordinator. In Thad Allen's case, he stopped being the head of the Coast Guard but about two weeks after mm -hmm. this event, or three weeks after this event occurred. So it took, it took an additional designation to, to name him once again a federal unseen coordinator, because all those titles fall away as you walk away from the assignment. That gives you certain authority to command operations but it doesn't necessarily give you authority to force people to the table. It's really, it's really a, 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 you know, more, of a, more of a negotiation, if you will, with these agencies. Because all you do under the Oil Pollution Act of 1990 is clean up oil and protect environmentally sensitive areas. The other interesting thing about that act is it didn't, it, it didn't envision economic impact as being of concern. It really only speaks to environmental impact. Right. And, and as we know, economic impact was a huge piece of this. Mental, mental health was a huge piece of this, seafood safety. So, so what it really took was, was, was the, the backing of the White House mm -hmm. for this individual, Thad Allen, as the National Incident Commander. And it was, it was more positional authority rather than, than statutory authority that got it done. And, and that's why I would say, I mean, he's a, he's a great case study in how you take how you take persuasive right. authority and, um, and turn it into action. Uh, and, and that's what it really took. And, and actually, Juliet underplays her role. She did a superb job of actually pulling all those teams together. Because these were, these were not people who always play very nicely together. And, uh, and, and, and there are lots of, there are lots of uh, separate agendas Department being of, run. Yeah. And, and there are people who would rather do it their way right. than get involved. Right. And she did a great job of kind of keeping everybody focused in a, in, a, in a unified way on what the objectives were. I did not know that there was a long history of um, between the Agriculture Department and the EPA, which I walked straight into not knowing that there was, you know, decades of yeah, there animosity. Of, a lot of fan that, blades right, out there. That's, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someone had told me, but thank you. Anyone else? That's it. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thanks.